I'm Hogan Gidley. Today, Chad Wolf and I will speak with former Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson, who is also a world-renowned surgeon, by the way. And we're going to discuss how to reignite the American dream for all Americans. Welcome to The Tank. Coming to you from our nation's capital, this is The Tank, your voice in Washington, D.C. and around the country. Broadcasting from the America First Policy Institute offices in D.C., this is the premier think tank podcast where we discuss the challenges facing our nation, talk policy, and advance America First solutions. Welcome to The Tank. Hello, this is Chad Wolf, And this is Hogan Gidley. Coming up, we will be sitting down with Dr. Ben Carson uh, to have a very informative conversation. But first, we want to uh, weigh in with a very Im important issue, continues to be top of mind for many Americans, and that continues to be the crisis along the southern border. We've had some developments over the last week or so, uh, I would say about five, last five or so days have been very tragic. So we're going to jump right into that, and that, of course, is the uh, murder of uh, Lake and Riley in Athens, Georgia a nursing student. Um, I would say that, yeah, I, definitely the Athens community, but the entire country is mourning her death. And, you know, the more information that comes out about the individual uh, that has been alleged uh, to be her murderer, the more issues that we have with the situation, Hogan. Um, I'll give folks just a rundown of where we're at, and then would love to get your, your thoughts and comments. Um, so despite what some in the left want you to believe he's not an Athens resident. He's not a Georgian resident, uh, doesn't live in Georgia. He's actually not an American resident. He's an illegal alien that came across the border illegally uh, in the El Paso sector in uh, late 22, September of 22, I believe. Um, he was paroled into the country under uh, the parole program that was set up uh, in 2022 under this administration illegally, I should might add, uh, and the courts, a number of court cases are bearing that out. Uh, then allowed to travel anywhere he wanted, and New York City was his spot. Um, committed a couple of um, crimes there, was not detained, uh, and of course New York City, being a sanctuary city, uh, released him. Traveled down to Athens, committed more crimes. Athens is a sanctuary city, and the, and the you know, sort of beat goes on and on and on. And then, of course, uh, commits uh, allegedly commits this terrible act. And so I think what this underscores is just the, um, obviously, one, the senseless nature of, of, of what occurred, but two, the fact that what we've seen along the border in three years has consequences, unfortunately. And some of those consequences are very, are very dire and very serious. Some of the consequences aren't. Uh, they're not as serious. But anytime something like this happens, and unfortunately this type of, uh, of incident, uh, this death happens all too frequent. This happens to be the one that's grabbing a lot of headlines as it should. Uh, but we see these, uh, there are multiple and multiple of these every single week. You just have to look at the statistics and, and bear that out. So we'd love to get your thoughts, Hogan, on, on kind of where we stand. It's now about six days after the incident. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, quite frankly, speaking out about this. Yeah, they should be. Um, the anger uh, is is noticeable on, on the right and has been now for years. The left is just kind of coming to this conclusion all of a sudden because they can't ignore it anymore. Thankfully, we've had some governors out there who've decided we're not going to be the the uh, the um, you know the whipping boy for this. We're going to make sure other uh, states, other cities that claim they would take any of these immigrants in. And they would love them and give them housing and give them care. That anyone who suggests you shouldn't do that is somehow evil. We should take them in. And, of course, put your money where your mouth is. You start to send illegal aliens into New York. You start to send them into Detroit and Chicago. And what do you know? Within just a few weeks, a month, these leaders who were standing before signs that said, we, we accept everyone, we want everyone, are now saying we can't handle it anymore. It's putting a strain on our education system, on our health care system, on our first responders, uh, on our city streets, on our housing. All of these things are so obvious that living under the thumb of your own policy kind of makes you change policy in a hurry. And this situation is so disgusting, so sad, so tragic— and I've often said this, any of these crimes committed, rapes, homicides, burglaries, aggravated assault, 
DUIs, whatever they may be, if they're committed by an illegal alien, these crimes are 100% preventable. They do not have to happen. And the left has been telling you for three years, there is no crisis at the border. The White House, there is no crisis at the border. Not a crisis, not a crisis, not a crisis. And then all of a sudden, you hear the left and the president say, yeah, there's a crisis and it's all the right's fault. That's insane. Everyone knows who's to blame for this. And the president of the United States sits up there and says things like, you know, the, the border is secure. It is closed. Mayorkas, the border is secure. The border is closed. The press secretary, the same thing. He acts as if these things, does Joe Biden, he acts as if they're happening to him, but they're happening because of him and his policies. And the residents in Athens, Georgia, I was just there during the football season. What a beautiful town. What incredible people live there. And to know that the media is trying to spin this, as you said, an Athens resident committed yeah. this crime. He wasn't. Second is, they tried to say things like the the fear of the solo female athlete really is is to be monitored here. Like you can't run in your community because it's your fault. You're out deciding to exercise and run. You, you know you're just going to face these problems. This is part of the the situation we're in. So many ways to go with this. It's just so infuriating to watch the left try and get cover from the media, and now all of a sudden. They have this epiphany like it's a problem when we've been talking about this now yeah, for years. It, it's not only just cover from the media. I mean, part of presumably what a journalist should do is actually just tell the facts, right? And when you say presumably he's a he's a resident or you focus on the fact that it's a solo female that's jogging, you're not actually getting to the heart of the matter, which is the individual is not American, came into the country illegally. And progress has through. a rap sheet, by the yes, way. Yes, and it has different like those are the facts. Now you can talk about other things that are impacting it, but to 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 gloss not even gloss over, just to omit those facts, you're doing a disservice. Uh, I mean, we could talk about journalism or the lack thereof, but you're doing a disservice uh, to your readership or whoever you know listens to those folks. So it's hard to you know as someone who obviously deals with this a lot and certainly did in a previous life. It, it, it's, it's very difficult because the reality here is, as you said, Hogan, this didn't have to happen. Um, and we didn't have to go down there. Love to hear. We've got a clip from um, the governor of Georgia, um, Brian Kemp. Obviously it's impacting his community. I was just in uh, Georgia on, on Monday of this week. So several days ago, uh, it is what everyone is talking about there. Yep. So let's let's listen to the governor. Lincoln's death is a direct result of failed policies on the federal level and an unwillingness by this White House to secure the southern border. We need to demand better from this administration. And that's something that I've been doing since I've taken office. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the governor's hit it right on the head. And, and look, I, I see and, and hear a lot of people, particularly on the other side, saying, oh, well, you know, they use these terms that that Republicans are pouncing on this issue. Always. Right. We uh, That's code for we noticed your mistake <laughs> yeah. and now they're mad at us for noticing. But uh, this idea that you can't that somehow that if conservatives talk about the fact that there is that they tie an open border to this unfortunate death, that somehow we're playing politics with this issue is ridiculous when there's causation between one and two. Right. And so, but that's what they want you to believe. They want they want you to say, okay, the the death is terrible. They actually acknowledge that, so good for them. But then they want to stop there, and they don't want to talk about well, why did this young woman die? Let me and what were the reasons that contributed to it? Let me just ask it this way to you: you answer these questions, not hypothetical. I want you to answer these questions. Did the guy come across the southern border illegally? Yes. Did he come in under the Biden administration's open border policies? Yes. Was he arrested or charged with anything other? than this crime before this crime occurred? No. I mean, he well, yes, he was arrested several times okay. in New York City and then in Athens. Not at the border, no. mind you. No, so not at the border. That was my hesitation. So the guy but, had yeah. a rap sheet. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the cu guy came across the border illegally, came in under the open border policies. He had a rap sheet. They had a chance to arrest him and give him back to ICE, get him out of the country. But instead, the policies allowed him to roam free, and now we've got this death and well, Democrats look around like, how did this happen? I think you've got two things going. I think that, that's exactly right. You've got a set of open border policies that, that contributed towards this, and then you had a set of 
uh, what I would say is soft on crime policies that deal with this. So as this individual comes across, and, and presumably, and it's been reported that he, he came across with his family, um, this is, and family detention is hard. It's hard to detain families, and I acknowledge that, and we did certainly acknowledge that during the Trump administration. It's, it's one of the primary reasons that we put Remain in Mexico in place, because you have to release families almost immediately once they come across the border. They know that. The smugglers know that. The traffickers know that. And so what do they do? They keep pushing more and more families across that border. So that's why Remain in Mexico, in addition to many different reasons, if Remain in Mexico was in place, then the suspect and his family would be in that program and would not have been released into American communities. But, but Chad, there was a Senate bill that was just kind of, <laughs> right, that had just been proposed. It failed. Had that been passed, wouldn't this have stopped this horrific act? No. Well, okay. Tell I mean, us why. I mean, are you? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I guess what the left would say if this was passed in 2022, right? Because that's when his illegal entry occurred and everything else occurred after that. But even if you said if it was in place, no, the actual provisions of that bill would not have stopped this. It, it's that bill was flawed for many reasons, which we've talked about in previous episodes. What about but HR two? HR two actually mandates remain in Mexico. <laughs> that's right? what I thought. So okay, that is a actually. Part of which was what a we're House bill that passed. Yeah. It's just languishing in the Senate that actually had some real teeth to it that prevented illegal immigration from running rampant all over the country. But whatever. Yeah. So again, this the and look, unfortunately, as I indicated, Lincoln Riley is not the only victim uh, here. There are many more that have come out in recent days and will continue. This, this happens all too frequently, um, and I think we lose sight of the victims here. Um, many of these victims are, are American citizens and others. Um, and we don't want to talk about the tough issues and the tough issues are let's stop this and let's stop this by securing the border and bringing some sanity back to this, this issue. Yeah. And that's the thing. The, the, the policy prescriptions here are simple, but they're difficult for the left to acknowledge, um, not just their effectiveness because what they want is the appearance of caring so much, but if you cared so much, you would put an end to this in a hurry because you can put an end to it in a hurry. Again, I would argue it's not by accident, it's by design, but that's another topic for another time. Um, I didn't mean that for that to rhyme, but it did. did you well, see that? I, yeah, you're it's fine. pretty good. Uh, that's you're right. good at that. Uh, that's true. Okay, um, so we have another clip, yes? Yes. Okay, for, this is from Leo 2.0 Terrell. Um, that's what he's called. That's his name. Is that right? He has it on a hat, yes. Okay. I, and I know Leo well, good guy. Um He's a civil rights attorney, and he had uh, a lot to talk about as related to the Associated Press, who had a headline I addressed, uh, brought up a little bit earlier. It said, the killing of a nursing student out for a run highlights the fear of solo female athletes. So let's hear what Leo had to say about that. That story by AP is insulting and misleading. It's journalistic malpractice. You're a journalist. I'm a lawyer. They left out every single fact of the nature of the suspect, that he's an illegal alien, that he has a criminal record, that he left New York on a criminal charge. This is what the left, uh, and particularly the media, the traditional media, uh, or say legacy media, this is what they want to do. They, wanna, they don't want to talk about the tough issues. And in this case, talking about those tough issues makes their, in my mind, their preferred candidate look bad. And so they don't want anything about it. Um, and I, but I think the good news here is that the American people are seeing through this, right? I think if you look at any poll, and I've looked at a couple here, um, unfortunately, since this incident occurred, and uh, the last one I saw was just this morning, 83%, 83% of Americans who have a hard time agreeing on anything, but 83% say that they uh, they either they disfavor the, the manner in which the Biden administration is uh, operating along the border in the border crisis. It's either somewhat disfavorable or really disfavorable. Um, but they are not happy with what's going on here. And so no matter what the left tries to do and the media tries to do and try to whitewash this a little bit and tries to tell you, you know, not all the facts, the American people are 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 getting the facts. They are. And in large part because of some brave um, governors out there who said, "Look, we can't handle all of this. We're gonna we're gonna let you live under the 
the the the rule that you you yourself have implemented with sanctuary cities and the like. And you know, a tragedy like Lincoln Riley is horrific, but it brings attention to a, an issue where so many others around this country have also been victim to uh, the illegal behavior of illegal aliens. I mean, the numbers are staggering, and and the instances are are grotesque. But this isn't the only one that's happened recently. But it is a high profile one, and it allows the media and 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 the American people writ large to kind of go back and go, wait a minute, is this commonplace? Is this happening all the time? And you start to see all of these headlines and all of these instances where you're like, this isn't an outlier. This is kind of part and parcel with bad policy, right? It's grabbed everyone's attention because it's really, really high profile and it's a really bad case. Uh, It's a heartbreaking story, but there are, I would say hundreds, if not thousands of more of these stories that occur around the country in different communities Every single day, and some of those, as you indicated, Hogan, are starting to get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more attention now. Yeah, there's this shootout I'm looking at here that killed a two-year-old boy and injured a teen mom. Um, a, a, a legal, a legal alien was charged with first and second degree murder for this. Um, from El Salvador, he's previously arrested twice, and it just seems like every time one of these crimes occurs, this isn't their first offense. Like. They could have picked them up yeah. in some other capacity and did, and some of the, the liberal leftist DAs let them out because, you know, that would be wrong to keep somebody who committed a crime. Or um, they don't have the manpower or the willingness to turn them over to ICE, so they just let them out for those reasons. It's just uh, it's, 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 it's a, a revolving bit, yeah. door of, of, of problems here. Or if, look, or if ICE does pick them up, but as you indicated— a lot of them are in sanctuary cities, so that doesn't occur. But right. those that aren't in sanctuary cities, ICE does pick them up. But what you see is the lowest removal rate in the last three years than we have seen in a very long time. Right. Even if they're picking them up, they're not removing them um, because they have this convoluted set of priorities where they only remove terrorists and and like really really bad. And you can't. It, it's not just you're a felon. You've got to be a convicted felon that's gone through the court system. They have the, all these weird priority uh, schemes that uh, really says you're only actually removing a small percentage. Yeah, and I have to ask you this because I, uh, you have hit on this before, but just so our audience knows, is money the issue? Money is not the issue. Do they need more money? No. I mean, y- 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 look, uh, folks in the department will always say that they could – use more resources to do a variety of different things but the crisis that that we're seeing and across the board is not a resource issue it's a it's a policy issue they've got to change policy and they when they change it you'll see a difference along the border and speaking of policy um i often talk about whenever i'm giving speeches how embarrassed i was when i went to the administration because i didn't really understand how much policy impacted people in this country and so many of us out here in america who are trying to to, uh, you know, change policy and put those America first um, policies back in place and ones that are proven to to uh, be successful in such a short amount of time, you realize that in order to enact those policies, you have to get people elected who share, you know, that America first view. But it it gets hard to elect those people uh, when you see uh, so many problems with the elections across this country. And listen, I'm here to tell you, we've done some incredible work, uh, not just on our own, but with uh, partnering with other groups around the country, passing some version or versions of election integrity laws in like 32 states, really working to protect legal votes and legal voters. So we're a whole lot better off than we were back in 2020 and better off than we were in 2022. But just to highlight kind of one instance that was on my radar recently, to show kind of the insanity of the mentality of the left is is on on February twelfth, uh, a- a- AFPI we we filed a lawsuit in Maricopa County, which is one of the biggest counties, uh, really determines the outcome of the election uh, in Arizona, and we and we filed that lawsuit on the ha- on behalf of the uh, Arizona Free Enterprise Club. We're trying to block Arizona's Secretary of State because. <laughs> They want to prohibit citizens from monitoring election drop boxes, from monitoring poll places. So I'm confused. You don't want people 
to be watching the voting process because you don't want it to be transparent or you don't want it to be secure. You don't, you just want it to happen in the dead of night. It, it's, it, and, and by the way, after we filed the lawsuit, just eight days later, the Democrat National Committee and the Arizona Democrat Party, um, they also intervened and they tried to stop what we had done. And this is insane because, well, as I mentioned, all people want to do is yeah. protect legal votes and legal voters. That's it. And people on the right and the left have been complaining about this for decades. And when you have overt attempts by an entire portion of the country, the left, to say, no, no, you can't monitor voting. I mean, that's insane. Yeah. No, it's it's a couple of points here. One, uh, very nice transition, by the way. We were talking about border and immigration, and you move right into election integrity. I so, should do this for so a living. It's, that's a very nice transition. Wanted to point that out. Uh, two, look, anytime the DNC uh, wants to weigh in on a lawsuit that obviously we're a party of or anyone, you know you're over the target. You sure. know you're doing something right. You know you're on to something uh, because they're now involved uh, and they're trying to protect their interest in, in the like. So I think... I think it's an important lawsuit. I agree with you. Uh, it doesn't, from a, a logical standpoint, I don't know how they argue this. I don't know how they argue that they want less oversight, that they want less eyeballs on these things, that they want less transparency. It doesn't, it, it cuts against everything they've ever said. No, 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 it doesn't. I, I, I would disagree. I think it's right in line with what they've said. Wow. If they're trying to trans your kids behind your back, sure. teach them critical race theory behind your back. Now what we find out what they're teaching our kids in college, I mean, election it, integrity, they don't want trans, they don't want well, you to see behind the curtain. They don't want transparency. So I would say that it's in line with their certainly with their overall goals. It's not in line yes. with what they publicly yes. say. Yes, that's true. Right. That's true. So I because, think that's interesting. Uh, believe me. And one of the things I think moving into this uh, upcoming season of of this country is is accountability. We're seeing a lot of things happen in a lot of these states with election integrity, with other issues, where people are caught with big problems. Yeah. People are, are, are pushing um, bad policy. Someone needs to hold them accountable, whether it be through lawsuits, whether it be through um, you know, elections. Yeah. And I think uh, America First and the Center for Election Integrity, uh, we really are doing a good job working together to expose the problem and then what, you know, file lawsuits to make sure people are aware of this and that the bad behavior stops. Could not agree with you more. Well, look, I think if you've listened to the Tank podcast at all recently, you know that we try to bring you some policy expertise. So whether it's on the border or election integrity a little bit in this episode, uh, we're giving you some, some good policy chops here. We've got a great uh, guest coming up. Um, who's going to talk to you in detail about some of the work he did during the Trump administration in, in advancing that American dream. Um, so without any... Well, uh, well, hold, on, no, okay. no, no, hold on, hold on, okay. hold on, hold on. So just... Well, I that was a good to, intro. It was a great intro. I mean, it was great. The Gifted Hand story, that he, the movie they did yeah, with, you yeah. know, uh, the with, Carson with Dr. Carson. With Dr. Yeah. Carson. Um, my mother used to teach that to her kids. We'd play it. So they would see... Well, you should it doesn't bring that matter. Up with your, him. I should bring that up with him. Maybe I will. But Cuba Gooding Jr. played him. And you remember the famous line from that movie was, Show me the money. Wrong movie. But okay, okay, yeah, okay. Maybe that's wrong. wrong. Maybe that's wrong. wrong maybe that's movie. a different movie. Different no, I'm, movie. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, Ben Carson's great. He's one of my favorite cabinet secretaries, a good guy, a uh, great patriot. And I look forward to the conversation, of All course. All right. Let's bring him in. All right. Well, we are honored uh, to have a very special guest on the show with us today, Dr. Ben Carson. Uh, doctor does not need any introduction from me, though I will do that. Uh, obviously, he's been a retired uh, neurosurgeon, um, spent most of his life actually in the operating room and has become very famous for that. We, we can talk a little bit about the not only the book, but the movie about his life uh, as a doctor. Of course, he was a candidate for president in 2016, served as a 17th secretary for the Department of Housing uh, and Urban Development. In the Trump administration, we're certainly going to get into his time there. And then today, he is the founder of the American Cornerstone Institute, which I know works uh, with uh, our team here at the America First Policy Institute. Dr. Carsons, it is a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for spending some time with us. Uh, it's always wonderful to be with you. Thanks for being a patriot. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I appreciate that. We're going to jump right in because we've got so limited amount of your time. I, I'm going to start the conversation here a little bit um, back where you grew up, right? Detroit, Michigan. Yes. Um, humble beginnings. And in, in many respects, you know, your story is that story of the American dream coming from, uh, again, humble beginnings and, and going to Yale and going on to become a doctor would love to talk a little bit about just your early life uh, and how it has perhaps influenced you as you've progressed through your career, obviously serving in the cabinet of the of the Trump administration and really living that American dream. So it's kind of an open ended question, but would love to hear from you, like how, how your upbringing and, and what you experienced influenced your life uh, later on in your career. Well, as a youngster, you know, I just had one aspiration. I wanted to be a doctor. For some reason, even as a very young child, I was just smitten by what doctors do, particularly missionary doctors traveling all over the world at great personal peril to bring physical, mental, and spiritual healing to people. I didn't think there was anything more noble one could do. Only problem was to become a doctor, you have to be a good student. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I was a horrible student. <laughs> Hogan knows and, something uh, about that. <laughs> yeah, Fair. that that coupled with uh, dire poverty after my parents got divorced when I was young, and uh, my mother had less than a third grade education, but she's perhaps the wisest person I've ever known. And uh, you know, she recognized how important education was. She worked as a domestic cleaning houses, and she would leave at five in the morning and get back at midnight because she didn't want to be on welfare. And she believed in personal responsibility and never being a victim. Uh, She never felt sorry for herself. Problem was she never felt sorry for us either. So (laughs) she never accepted, (laughs) she never accepted any excuse for anything. And uh, the minute we made an excuse out of her mouth was the poem, yourself to blame. And we didn't want to hear that poem, so we stopped making excuses. Uh, But what a difference that made in our lives. And she made me start reading books, turned off the TV, which, of course, I hated. But uh, after a while, I actually began to enjoy it because... We were very poor, but between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere. I could be yeah. anybody. I could do sure. anything. It was it was a major escape for me, but uh, also reading about people of accomplishment and recognizing that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you is you. And uh, I stopped listening to all the people who said, you can't do this. You can't do that. The system is against you. I just threw all that stuff in the garbage can. And uh, I got to the point where if I had five minutes, I was reading a book. And I went from being called a dummy to being called a bookworm. <laughs> and uh, it, it really set me on a, on a very different trajectory. The, the, the only problem that I had then was I, was, I had a, a, a very bad temper. I would sort of fly off the handle and do ridiculous things. But uh, the good Lord helped me to get that under control, completely changed my personality. Yeah. And uh, most people can't, can't, people can't believe that. Well, that's, a, no. that's what I was about, I was about no. to say. You're the most mild manner individual I think I've ever met. Uh, so this idea of a, of a uh, flaring temper, I just, I can't picture it. It's hard. It's hard. But, you know, when the God changes you, then just do a, a paint job. He fixes oh, wow. you from the inside. And it made a big difference for, and then it was off to Yale. And, uh, you know, that was quite an experience for me. I had never been to a restaurant before, before I went to Yale. Wow. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got China and silver and these great paintings on the mahogany walls and oriental rugs. And it was a a major uh, culture shock. But uh, I adjusted to that fairly quickly. Uh, after some difficulties in my freshman year because I was treating my studies the same way I did in high school. (laughs) You know, in high school, all I needed to do was study an hour before the exam to get 100. So I was just messing around. And it didn't work that way at Yale, though. (laughs) So, But uh, once I 
got that problem resolved, uh, the rest of it was pretty smooth sailing. Well, but I do have a, a serious question for you. But but before, did you just say that whenever you said something to your mom, she had to had you recite a poem or she said a poem? And what was the name of that poem again? No, no she she said a poem called "Yourself to Blame" by Mamie White, and it's it's uh, actually. I recite that poem in several of my books because it had such a profound effect on me. <laughs> and but, so you, uh, you quit you quit making excuses because you didn't want to hear the poem anymore. That's great. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, and, and, ult- and ultimately learning to really accept responsibility for whatever is going on, no matter what it is. Of course. Um, you know, Dr. Carson, we've known each other since the Trump administration, even before that at some of your speeches, I came up and told you that my mother actually used to use uh, your movie, uh, Gifted Hands, the Ben Carson story oh, yeah. in in her classroom to teach you could be anything you wanted to be and talk about you. And and we even had that conversation, I think, at CPAC back when it was back at the Omni Shoreham, you know, decades ago. But That's right. regardless of that, something you may not remember, but you had a birthday party um, a couple of years ago that I was blessed enough to attend. And I remember we were standing, it was at Mount Vernon, and we're looking over uh, the Potomac, I believe, and and fireworks were going Mm -hmm. off in celebration of your life, who you are as a person, who you are as a man, and what you've been able to accomplish. But I remember coming up to you, and I put my arm around you and said, can you imagine someone with your background, someone with my background, coming from a single mother, what I did, all the struggles you had to to face and, and meet, standing out on George Washington's backyard having people show up to celebrate your life with fireworks and, and fun and, and fellowship and friendship. It, it, it just, it reminded me of how great this country could be. And you looked at me and said something similar. You said, yeah, that's what makes America, America. And could you talk a little bit about our country's greatness, um, where you think it's turned and then, and then how you think we can get it back? Well, first of all, it is still great. It's just that it's been knocked down a couple of notches. <laughs> right. uh, because yeah. all these all these people who talk about how horrible our country is don't seem to realize that if it was all that bad, all these people wouldn't be trying to get in here. Right. So That's obviously it still, still has some gleam to it. But uh, what we have to remember is we were formed in a way that was very different from most other countries. And in fact, the Europeans thought we were nuts. They said, you can't run a country on the will of the people. You have to have a monarch. Uh, But our founders were incredibly smart people. They studied every government that existed. And one of the things that they recognized is that all governments eventually end up pretty much in the same place, no matter what their ideals are in the beginning. They grow, they infiltrate, and they dominate. And they wanted to give us a constitution that would keep the government from dominating our lives. And what we've seen uh, recently is that the government has become much more invasive. They want to tell you what kind of oven you can have, what kind of car you can drive, right? Uh, all kinds of environmental rules and what you can say and what you can't say. I mean, it it's turning into a nightmare. And the people are going to have to recognize what's happening. This is what Benjamin Franklin was talking about when he came out of that Constitution Hall in 1787 and was asked, what do we have here, sir, a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, we've kept it for over 240 years but we're as close to losing it now as we have ever been. When you look at the fact that we have forces all over this country that are trying to deprive the people of the mechanism of power that they have, which is their vote, trying to take people off the ballot, decide who you can vote for. You know, that is what you see in banana republics and in socialist and Marxist countries. And I think the American people actually realize that the American people are a lot smarter than the leftists give them credit for. And they thought they could easily just manipulate them and indict Trump out of existence and have the election that they desire to have. 
The only problem is I think they underestimated Donald Trump. They don't realize that every time they stick a needle into him, it makes him more energetic. Sure, <laughs> and yeah. Consequently, uh, this is backfiring on them. But the people also know that if we allow our justice system to be used to eliminate a political opponent, we will never be the same again. We will be the world's largest banana republic, and uh, we will deteriorate steadily from there. And the people know that, and that's why they're standing with Trump. And I think that momentum will actually pick up as we approach the election. But it's going to be the nastiest election ever, because yeah. you're talking about people— they call it a swamp. I say that's a compliment. It's a cesspool. <laughs> and they want to protect themselves. And they know that Donald Trump knows who they are and may not come after them individually, specifically, but wants to fix the system to empower the people once again. Well, you certainly bring up a, a number of good issues uh, in that, you know, weaponization is, is certainly, I think, something that a lot of Americans are seeing and very, very concerned about. I know we do a lot of work here at AFPI on that issue and others to do as well. So thank you for bringing that up. I wanted to maybe start uh, with your service in the Trump administration. Obviously, you had a background as a, a neurosurgeon, right? And so I think most people would say, well, you know, Dr. Carson's going to be able to serve the administration perhaps in a, in a healthcare, you know, healthcare way of some sort. But you went to, to housing and urban development. Tell us why that appealed to you um, and, and why you wanted to spend four years of your, of your life there serving that mission and, uh, you know, a couple of the things that you're most, most proud of during that time. Well, having grown up in, in dire poverty and seeing people who lived in public housing and being with them and sleeping in the same area and hearing their philosophies on life and seeing how some so many people were made to be dependent upon our government. And uh, that's the reason that I wanted to get involved. I wanted to see if there was a way that we could give people a pathway out of dependency. And... Uh, also, I believe very much, like Donald Trump, that a rising tide floats all boats. And that's yeah. exactly what happened. You know, we were able to enact the kinds of policies that would help to create self-sufficiency. The policies that exist already are just the opposite. And, you know, what made America into a great nation? It was the can-do attitude, not the what-can-you-do-for-me attitude, which is infecting so many people and making victims of people who should be out there uh, accomplishing things for their own lives and for society. So those are the things that, that drove us. Yeah. But one of the first things we found was that there were so many material defects. Uh, when you look at the books, it had that they had not had an audit in eight years. You're required to have an audit every year, every federal agency. You couldn't do an audit. It was just absolutely absurd. And uh, so that was the first thing we had to rectify. But you probably noticed a year and a half into the Trump administration, you never heard stories about that at HUD anymore. The most corrupt agency, you never heard it anymore. That's great. And uh, that allowed us to be able to, to concentrate on some of the other things, you know, we were the agency that drove the opportunity zones. Absolutely. I don't think that gets nearly enough credit. So true. Um, I mean, in two years, attracting seventy-five billion dollars of private capital into neglected neighborhoods, and uh, you know that resulted in five hundred thousand jobs, and uh, lifted a whole bunch of people out of poverty. Those were incredible things. Incredible. And then, you know, we, we started the Envision Centers where you put all these agencies under one roof so that that mother, that teenage mom with three kids could come to one place, get child care, get her GED, get further training so that she could become self-sufficient. More important, 
teaching that to our children because that's the only way we break the cycle of poverty. We have to empower people. And, uh, you know, I thought that would be an easy sell, but it wasn't. I found that there were a lot of people on the Hill, particularly on the other side of the aisle, who were not interested in getting people out of poverty. who were not interested in getting people out of dependency because that's where they derived their power from. You so, know, Dr. Carson, you just hit on something. I, I want to pause and see if we can dig into a little bit, because I think this is important. The, the, the left is so focused on gaining and maintaining political power. You talked about opportunity zones where we saw record economic growth around the country. It turned out that inside those opportunity zones, um, the growth was outpacing the national average. It was somewhere around 8% in opportunity zones, which is higher than than anywhere else in the country because of the, the investment, as you just pointed out. But when you go on Capitol Hill and you're having these conversations with legislators, um, you, you're talking about successes that are obvious, that are proven, that you can kind of quantify. My, my question is, as you begin to see kind of a migration, I think, in, in large part, from the black community to the conservative movement because of America First leaders like yourself, um, do you find that one of the reasons why that migration is happening is because the realization of successful policies that didn't just help um, you know, lives in, in real time, but set up opportunities for a brighter future is the reason? Like, what do you attribute a lot of the news stories and a lot of the polling that shows so many people in the black community really taking a look at the conservative movement and, and, and either signing up or at the very least uh, asking some, some serious questions about why they should change their past history of support. Well, I think people are seeing that the conservative movement offers consistency and fairness for everybody. So it, it, it doesn't matter, you know, who is there the philosophy is we're going to do things that benefit everybody and don't pit one group against another group for their benefits. And uh, and you look at the fact that President Trump uh, arranged things such that the HBCU presidents didn't have to come every year begging for funding. What right. a difference that makes. Yep. And educational policies that that encouraged um, people to be able to have freedom of choice because what a difference that makes. I remember in Baltimore during the No Child Left Behind era, there were a bunch of schools that failed and they weren't uh, teaching anybody anything. So the program was going to move those kids to other schools. And the politicians, the corrupt politicians came and stood around the school and said, no, you're not taking our kids from our failing schools, rather than spending their time saying, why are these schools failing? Because that yep. makes all the difference in the world to what happens to those children. Well, that's a harder fix. But that's a harder fix, it's, right? It's a harder fix, but a, a much more worthwhile of fix. Of course, well, that's what I'm run. saying. That's what I'm saying. They don't, yeah. want, they don't want to worry about fixing it, as you said. They'd rather just use it. Um, and, and keep exactly. people in a failing situation because the fix to that is much more difficult. You have to kind of figure out why they are failing. You have to address some teachers that may may or may not be doing their job. Some some uh, you know parental issues at home that that um, so many on the left refuse to acknowledge as a main catalyst or reason for failure as well. And so a, a lot of times you you just here, it's more money. They just need more money, and that's the issue. And you see that when recent reports show you talked about Baltimore. There's not a single school that's proficient in math or reading. Exactly. Not a single student. And that's that's happening all over the country. And I think a lot of people in the black community are waking up to the fact that it's the policies of some of the— and, and, and I don't want to demonize the left because— in many cases, they actually think that they're doing the right thing. They think that they are righteous and that everybody else is wrong. But what they need to do is stop and look at the data. Right. What does the data tell you? What is it that, you know, what, even the Brookings Institution, which is a left-leaning institution, they did a massive study on poverty and concluded that there were three things that you could do 
that will reduce your risk of living in poverty to 2% or less. Finish at least high school, get a job, and wait until you're married to have children. You know, that used not to require a study. We used to know stuff like that. <laughs> that was just called common sense, right? We didn't exactly. need data for that, sure. Yeah, that's, uh, th- I mean, that's that's great advice. Uh, I hadn't seen that study, but I, I think that's just some common sense advice as well. Let me let me keep the conversation going, Doctor. Um, obviously, after four years of of serving in the Trump administration and, and leading uh, HUD, you went on to establish the American Cornerstone Institute, and obviously one of the initiatives. But you've got many. But one is is patriotic education. So, would love to hear from you, like why why that's a passion of yours, a passion of the institutes, what you guys are doing in that space, and why it's so important. Well, you know, American Cornerstone focuses on those cornerstone principles that made us into a great nation. We didn't get there by coincidence. It was because of cornerstone number one, our faith, which taught us to love your neighbor, not to cancel your neighbor if you don't agree with him. And uh, liberty, the freedom to lead the life that you want to lead without somebody mandating everything you have to do. Community the ability to work for the common good, which is why we succeeded early on, because people from different countries with different languages understood the concept of the common good. And if your neighbor was in need, you helped them. And then the cornerstone of life from the womb to the tomb. And that's something that uh, we emphasize because as we've grown more coarse in our relationships with respect for life, Look what's happened to our relationship with each other, and we need to fix that. And then we have the Little Patriots program, which focuses on on the children. We call it the inoculation to indoctrination. (laughs) That's great. I love that title. They they are absolutely being indoctrinated. And uh, you think about... uh, Vladimir Lenin, who said, give me your children to teach for four years and the seed that I sow will never be uprooted. Yeah. Why, do you, why do you think Eisenhower was told by Khrushchev 60 years ago, your grandchildren's children will live under our system and we won't have to fire a shot because they had all of this planned out. And, uh, you know, we, we are bringing that to people's attention, directing them to the congressional record January 10th, 1963, where Congressman Herlong from Florida read the 45 goals of communism in America. You'll see that most of them have been accomplished and they are flipping us. And we, the American people, are being manipulated into giving away something that everybody longs for and accepting something that hasn't worked for anyone. We have to be smarter than that. But in order to do that, we need to make sure people understand what's going on, how they're being manipulated, how this is a long-term process. It's been going on for a very long time. It's just that it manifests itself tremendously in the last few years because a window of opportunity has opened up with the kind of leadership that we have or lack thereof. Well, I I love that you guys are... are diving into that is such an important topic. I've got, I've got two kids in, in high school and I see some of the curriculum that they, they, they unfortunately are subjected to. So I, you know, God bless what you guys are doing there. Um, I, I, you know, can't, can't, uh, thank you enough, uh, for that. And, um, you know, just really well, excited that you're in that the, space. We, well, we appreciate the relationship we've had with, uh, America first and, you know, together we're going to get this done. Yeah. I have no no doubt that we're going to get it done. Well, I, we have one last question for you, um, and be careful about what you say to this. <laughs> be careful how you answer this, okay? <laughs> but to close us out. Meanwhile, I have to tell Hogan that a lot the time. during sure, the course sure, of the it's day. Fine. It's fine. Yeah. No big deal. Be careful. So can you share one story, uh, a, a quick story, from your time in the Trump administration that was really impactful for you, a conversation maybe you had with the president that was significant, or um, or funny or, or anything that we could uh, put out there because, you know, you were at such a high level. You did so much. And, um, you know, even even who you are and all you've been through, I, I know just knowing who you are and standing beside you in some of the most incredible moments in this nation's history, you know, these things are impactful. So explain to our audience, well, if you can, one of those instances. 
Well, I will tell you that the president has a tremendous sense of humor. 100%. And is a really fun person to be around when he's not being attacked. <laughs> <laughs> which is like 1% yeah, like which is like one percent of the time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. But uh, one incident that really told me what we were up against uh, are envision centers, uh, which brought federal, state, and local agencies along with faith-based organizations, nonprofits, and for-profits together under the same roof to address the needs of the communities that were distressed. And uh, one of them was really buzzing. There were like 33 different agencies in the building. And uh, I remember going there and it was just so crowded, people coming and, and seeking the services. But some of the people, some of the leftists in the area promised them a $100,000 donation if they would change the name and not call it an Envision Center because Envision Centers were associated with the Trump administration. Oh, my gosh. That, that tells you how sick our society is and what we're up against. We have to be very, very vigilant and recognize that, you know, there may be some sacrifice, that you may be attacked. There's no maybe to it. You will be attacked. But think about those people who came before us and what they were willing to do so that we could have peace and freedom. That's what we have to remember. Well, Dr. Carson, I, I just have to tell you how much we appreciate you coming on, uh, spending so much time with us today. We thank you for your decades of service to America. You really are an inspiration for us all. I know that you were for so many of my mother's students in her public school class and, and the millions around the world with all you've been able to accomplish, all you've been able to do. And uh, we, we want all of our audience to listen to us, of course, but we want you to check out Dr. Carson's podcast as well called Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. Perfect name for your podcast, by the way. Common Sense <laughs> with Dr. Ben Carson, wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to subscribe today to The Tank so you won't miss any of our upcoming episodes. Again, thanks you, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Carson, for your time. Thank you. And thanks for having me, and thank you both for being great patriots of our country. Text the word TANK to 70107. That's TANK to 70107 to get exclusive content from the Tank Podcast and to learn more about the America First Policy Institute.